I'll be reading from John 8, verse 21 through 29. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said again, he won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You are this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who are you? They questioned. Exactly what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you. But the one who sent me is true. And what I have heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know he was speaking to them about the father. So Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. So it's, it's been a joy meeting out here. Uh, thank you guys for being patient with us during a little bit of a crazy season. Um, as I said earlier, my name is Joel McCarty. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor for preaching and oversight here at New Eden Church. Um, it's been a joy to do ministry alongside you all. Um, I truly count it a privilege to just be a part of what God is doing here, even during a really busy, chaotic season. Um, it's also like this season of the building. Kevin and I talk about how we feel like we're in just like a dead sprint trying to get to the end of this. And it's just kind of, you know, the, the thing that hangs over everything else we do. It's also hit me during quite a bit of a busy personal season season. And so it kind of adds a little bit of stress to an already stressful time. Now, all of us have some way that we like to unplug and decompress from stress. So I don't know what it is for you. Um, one of the ways that our modern America world, American world does that is through TV shows or movies, right? We can escape reality and enter into another world for a little bit um, and just sit back and watch that world. Um, so that's something that I do recently. My wife and I have been watching um, the show Ted Lasso together. So that's one that we won't watch if we can't watch it together. We'll just watch it alongside each other. So the other show that I kind of watch when she can't be there is the show Lost. So I, I know I'm like, I don't know, 10 years behind or something, but I've heard people talk about it. I was like, I need a new show to watch. I'm going to try it. Normally shows really make me annoyed like before season one ends and I give up on them, but I've stuck with this one. So I'm watching that show. Um, we're not caught up on either show, so don't come spoil anything. I don't like spoilers. Although with Lost, I think it's unfair because I'm like 10 years behind. So if you spoil that, that's on me, uh, not you guys. But so the show Lost, you know, the premise of the show, I mean, it makes sense. It's called Lost is that these people uh, have this airplane wreck and they're stranded on this island. And so the, the opening scene opens with them just scrambling, figuring figuring out what's going on, right? And so you're watching the show, and especially in season one, what you're watching is these people want to be rescued. And they not only want to be rescued, they actually expect to be rescued. They're, they're assuming that the rescue boat's going to come soon. They won't move inland because they want to stay on the beach. They want to send out signal fire so the rescue team can see them when they come. And so as the, the seasons progress, some of them get more comfortable and kind of make this place their home, but still like the resounding kind of theme underneath everything is that they still want to go home. They want to be rescued. They're longing and hoping to be saved. And today in our text, we're going to see a people who, whether they fully understand it or not, even though they might get distracted by life at times, like we do, ultimately they are longing and looking for a rescuer for a savior, for a Messiah. And the sad part is, 
He's right in front of them. But many of them refuse to believe. As we do here at New Eden, we're preaching through a book of the Bible. That's what we typically do. And we're in the Gospel of John currently. And this week we're in John chapter 8, verses 21 through 29, as you heard read a moment ago. I have this big idea for our theme. It should be on the screen for you. This is the big idea of our text today. Jesus is the rescuer we are all looking for. Jesus is the rescuer that we are all looking for. So as has been the case a lot recently, our text today is simply a conversation between Jesus and a group of people. This has been happening a lot. This week, it's a group referred simply to as the Jews. This group of people Jesus is conversing with is most likely a large group of diverse people, probably everything from haters that hate Jesus, skeptics, doubters, probably some who hopefully believe that maybe this is the coming Messiah and probably everybody in between. Last week we saw him, he just got done talking to some religious leaders and he said that he was the light of the world. And this week he's going to continue these claims of Messiahship with some statements to this crowd. So the conversation in our text, you just heard it read, it goes back and forth in a pretty clear manner. Um, in verse, this is like, I'm gonna give you a summary of the whole text real quick in like my own translation. Uh, this is the way I kind of understand it, um, kind of condensing it for us. So in, in verse 21, Jesus is like, yo guys, uh, I'm going away soon. Uh, you're gonna keep looking for a Messiah once I do, but you're not gonna find him. and sorry, you're gonna die in your sins. And the Jews are like, Huh? Like, what's he talking about? We're, we're a little confused as to what's going on here. Um, and then Jesus responds again. He's like, guys, I'm not like you. Of course, you don't get it. Um, we're not the same. Uh, you need to believe that I am who I say I am, or you're going to die in your sins. The Jews again are like, what are you talking about? Like, who are you? Is what they say. Like, who, I don't know if that's like, a, who do you think you are? Or, or who are you? What authority do you have to say these things? And then Jesus responds again. He's basically like, bro, like I've been saying this. He's like, I've been saying this from the beginning. And he's, he goes, he kind of makes a statement. It's kind of funny. He's like, I've got more to say too, but I'm going to kind of let that go right now because I'm only going to say what my father tells me to. And the Jews, again, were told by the narrator of the passage that they are confused. And then in verse 28 and 29, the end of our text, Jesus says, you're going to get it soon. You're going to see the plan when you eventually kill me. And then you'll know that I am the one you're looking for. And you'll also know that I'm not doing this on my own, that you'll see the big picture that I'm working with my father. And that's basically the conversation of our text today. Now, some of the language in our current understanding and the translations can be awkward in some of this. Um, we can get caught up in the text, but if we kind of just look at it, and as I was studying the text, there are these repeating themes. One of the repeated themes is that these people will die in their sins. Jesus says that three different times in the text. He also uses the language in the Greek, I am, multiple times, as we've already seen through John, which reminds us of Yahweh, the name of God. And so you, what you're seeing and what's building up in this text is this stark reality between who Jesus is and between, between who these people are. He compares himself with them. He says, we are not like each other. You are of this world. I am not of this world. You are from below. I am from above. And so there is this stark contrast that Jesus is headed to perfect union with his God, with his father. He's on a path to sinless and perfect eternal union. And that humans are on this path toward death and sin. And there is this giant gap and if they have eyes to see, and if we have eyes to see, we'll notice that we need a rescuer, that we are lost. We need someone to close the gap for us and divert our path from one towards death to a path toward life. But before we can do that, we have to be honest about death as Jesus is in this passage. There are three main thoughts about death from this text I want us to see which will all point us to our main idea that Jesus is the rescuer we are all looking for. So the first thought about death from our passage is the reality of death. This is something that we often don't like to talk about, but there's no getting away from the truths in this passage about sin and death that Jesus 
proclaimed. This is the reason we preach what we call expositionally. We preach through the whole text because it forces us to wrestle with things that sometimes we wouldn't naturally bring up. But death is a real thing. I know some of you personally have, have faced death with loved ones close to you in the last year. Like death has been, to me, it's just been closer than it has in a long time in the last six months, six to 12 months. And we have to wrestle with sin and death. As I was studying this text, I was struck afresh by the reality and these warnings about sin and death directly from the mouth of Jesus. This is not me bringing this to the text. Like, let's look at what Jesus has to say to the crowd and to us. John 8, 21 says, you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Verse 24 says, I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Because Jesus loves them deeply, and because he doesn't want them to die in their sins, he is not afraid to speak to them about the reality of death. Ultimately, because of sin in the world, there is a death that is coming to every man and woman. And none of us can escape this reality. And death stinks. Like it wasn't meant to be this way. Like we say death is a part of life and there's a sense in which, yes, it is now. But originally in the, the, the perfect world that God created, death was not meant to be a part of life. But sin has come into the world and we all at one time or another will face death. This phrase that's repeated three times, you will die in your sins. It could mean that. It could also mean you will die for or because of your sins. Either way, the stark reality is that death awaits and sin is the culprit. The other thing that should shock us about this statement that's important for us to see is that it's not only death, but it's also sin. So there is this physical aspect to dying, right? But there is also a spiritual death when we die still in our sins, that every single human is inflicted with the disease of sin. And this applies not only to the crowd that Jesus was talking to in his day, but it is a universal truth, <coughs> excuse me, that applies to all of us. We will die in our sins without belief in the Savior, Jesus Christ, our King. So he speaks not only of death, he speaks not only of sin, but he also speaks of a separation from their creator. He says, where I am going because of your sin, you cannot come. I'm going to be in union with my father, but you can't come. And this is something, again, we don't often like to talk about, but it's in the text and we've got to wrestle with it. Sin is bad. And it destroys, and not only in this age, we see the effects of it in this age, but also, and more importantly, in the age to come. And instead of getting upset or offended at the messenger, we might do well to heed the truth of the message. It's one thing I have to remind my kids about a lot. And as I remind them, it reminds me of the danger and destruction of sin. When they sin and they minimize it as not a big deal. I have to get on their level and I say, look, what you don't understand right now and you will someday is that sin will hurt not only you, but everyone around you. And ultimately, and I tell them this, your sin will lead to death and separation from God. And I don't want that for you. And then I ask them, you know what that means? You need someone to rescue you from sin's grasp. And then we have a conversation about Jesus. But if we don't acknowledge the reality of death and sin, if we simply get upset at the truth of the diagnosis, then we will never get to the cure. The message and the reality of death is a consistent, true, and authoritative message. Jesus says that. In verse 25 and 26, he says, I've been telling you this from the beginning. It's a consistent message. When Jesus first began his ministry, he said, hey, come to me. <clears throat> If you don't, you will find death. If you do, you will find life. It's been consistent. It's been true because it's backed by the authority of the Father. It's authoritative. In a culture that devalues and distrusts authority, 
and maybe sometimes rightly so, this is an authority that you can't afford to distrust. You can't afford to ignore this authoritative message. Jesus is not just trying to be the bearer of bad news. He cares deeply about these people and he cares deeply about you. So he shares these truths about the reality of death. But I love the way Jesus interacts because he doesn't just share about the reality of death. He gives the explanations. He shares as well about the reason for death. And that's the second thing we'll see. The reason for death. See, death ultimately awaits all of us because we are both sinners by circumstance and sinners by choice. And we need to understand this. We are all on one level, both the victims of sin's grasp and the perpetrators of sin. And we can't minimize either reality. They both need to be dealt with. In verse 23, Jesus plainly tells them, it should be on the screen. He says, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. This is their identity. They're of this world. Now, did these people have any control over the fact whether or not they were born into sin? Conceived in sin, as David said in Psalm 51? No. They had no control over this. This was the circumstance of sin that was around them. But Jesus doesn't mince words that this is their reality. They were born to do the will of sin and bound to its powerful sway. And these are the circumstances of sin that all of us find ourselves in. But they were also sinners by choice. Multiple times, these people had been given options to repent and turn from their sin and trust in this Messiah, but they refused to do so because to do so meant to give up their life and lose their own way of thinking. You see it in verse 24, 25, and 27 that they don't know the Father because they're rejecting Jesus, and you can't know the Father without coming to Jesus. And so my hope for us is that we don't either minimize the grasp of sin over us or others, because we can do that to the point that we don't show love and compassion. We make it all about the choice of sin, and we show no love or compassion when people are caught in sin's powerful grasp. Even God himself sees our frame and remembers that we are simply dust, and he has compassion and love toward us when he sees us caught in sin's grasp. And so may we not go to that extreme, but may we also not make excuses and pretend that we are just the victims of sin's grasp when the reality is we all on one level or another have chosen sin for our own purposes and selfish pleasures, ignoring the destruction that it's caused around us. And so the reason for death that Jesus gives is both the circumstances of sin we find ourselves in, but also the choices of sin that we have all willingly made. And it's a vicious cycle. But even in the midst of a dark passage such as this one, even in the midst of the stark reality of death, we find glimmers of hope, as we always do. See, the bad news with Jesus, the bad news never stays bad for long because there is always a rescue for those who admit that they need one. Look at verse 21 again. When he starts this, he says to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me. And you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. <laughs> Jesus says that when he goes back to his father, so this is after he dies and rises again and ascends to the father, that they will be looking for him. Now, this phrase can seem a little weird, but we've got to place ourselves in the minds of the Jewish audience. Ever since the days of the prophets, the Jews were longing for a Messiah-like figure. One who would come and redeem both the cosmos, the circumstance of sin, and the hearts of his people, the choices of sin. And so they're longing for this Messiah, this rescuer, the Savior. And Jesus has told them multiple times, that's me. You're looking at him. You're talking to him. They've heard this message, but they've rejected him. And so what Jesus is saying here is, hey, you're still going to be looking for me, meaning the Messiah, once I'm gone, and you're not going to find him. And because you're not going to find him, because you've rejected him, you're going to die in your sins. And you can't come to the place of beauty where I'm headed when you are a worker of sin. See, the thing is, even if we're not willing to admit it yet, 
All of us need a rescuer. And it's God's grace that sin destroys us to the point where we're willing to look up and say, help. I can't do this. We all need someone or something to save us from the circumstances of sin around us and the choices of sin that we have made with our own hearts. And you know what we try to do? We try to patch this brokenness, this destructiveness. We try to fix it with things of this age, with our own ways of thinking. Maybe we look for the solution. If I just had more free time and a better schedule, I would, my life would be better. Maybe if I was in a higher income bracket, maybe if I had a car that didn't break down, then I would not have stress in my life. Maybe if I found that therapist that was more in tune with me, maybe if I found this, this cause to live for and this purpose to live for and post about on Facebook, then like my life will be fulfilled. Maybe if I had that perfect relationship, that perfect person who would complete me, then I would be okay. Maybe if I voted a different president into power, it might save me. Maybe if I watched a new news channel that I agreed with more, I would be okay. And let me say clearly, none of those things are bad in and of themselves, but they can't save you. They can't save me. They can be gifts from the Father, good things, but they can't cause you to pass from death to life. They can't take a cold, dead heart that loves sin and replace it with the heart that beats with the rhythm of life and joy of the Spirit. They might patch the problem for a minute and cover the wound so no one can see it from the outside looking in, but that wound is still there. And yes, Jesus said, that without him, we could not go to where he was going. But he came to us. We've seen the reality of death, the reason for death. And lastly, we see the good news, the rescue from death. As I mentioned, there was this looking and longing for a rescuer. One who would come and save the world from sin and death. This, this idea is referenced throughout the entire Old Testament, but I want to look at one specific example, Isaiah chapter 43. There should be on the screen for you. I'm going to read a few verses from that chapter. This is a prophecy about what Yahweh is going to do for all his covenant people. It says in the first verse of Isaiah 43, now this is what the Lord says. I want you to notice these verses. The one who created you, Jacob, the one who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed or rescued you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters of this life, the circumstances of sin, I will be with you. And the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched and the flame will not burn you. In verse 10, he says, you are my witnesses. It's the Lord's declaration. He's the one saying this. You're my witnesses. You're my servant whom I have chosen. Why? Why? So that you may know and believe and understand that I am he. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He goes on to say, no God was formed before me. There will be none after me. I, I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no savior. You can't find the rescuer anywhere else. I alone declared, saved, and proclaimed, not some foreign God among you, not some God you fashion with your own hands that we, we still do to this day. You are my witnesses, and I am God. Also, from today on, I am he alone. None can rescue from my power. I act, and who can reverse it? And the rhetorical answer is no one. There's this prophecy of this chosen servant, these witnesses, which is what Jesus is fulfilling, that these people may know and believe that I am he, this name, we've seen it over and over in the gospel of John, this name I am that Yahweh declared to himself to Moses at the burning bush, that this Lord alone is the one who can save from the power of sin. And in our passage today, Jesus is again making it explicitly clear that he is the rescuer. He's the fulfillment of this. Look again at verse 24. I told you, you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, I can hear Jesus pleading with them. I am the Messiah. I'm the one I've been saying from the beginning, you will die in your sins. 
Jesus is honest about the reality of death and the reasons for death because he himself stands as the rescue from death. He lived the perfect life. He's the only one who didn't succumb to the circumstances of sin around him. As the tempter told him to choose earthly power over the path that the father had chosen for him, he remained steadfast. He was not tainted. He was not conceived in sin. In verse 23, he reminds us that he's from above. He's not from below. He's not of this world. As we're told in verse 29, he always did what pleased his father. He's the only child who's never disappointed their parent. But even though he lived the perfect life, he showed that he had power over both the circumstances and choices of sin. He still allowed himself to walk into the death that our sin deserved. Even though he warned us of dying because of our sin, the reality is he died because of our sin. He became sin on the cross. That's what he refers to when he says, you'll know when I'm lifted up. He's talking about his death on the cross. When he talked about going away, they said, is he going to kill himself? And the irony of this statement, because it was not going to be him killing himself. It was going to be the Jews placing him on a cross. And as he does this, Jesus deals with the reason for death, sin. And he stamps it out and he puts it to death. He deals with both the choices of sin we make in our heart and the circumstances of sin around us, the cosmos. And the gruesome reality of the cross, as we dwell on it, lets us never forget the destructiveness of sin. It tore apart the Son of God's flesh and skin. It pierced his side. It whipped His back, it nailed his hands and his feet to this bloody Roman torture instrument called the cross. And he willingly did that to rescue us. But verse 21 reminds us that Jesus did not stay in the grave. He said, I'm going somewhere. And that somewhere was not to the grave. His going away was not ultimately to death. It was going through death and resurrecting to sit at the right hand of his father in the place of authority. And even though he says that we can't join him there, John will later clarify that that's only true for those who die in their sins, that for those who believe that he is the one, for those who repent from trusting in the false rescuers of this age, when we turn to Jesus, we receive his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And and we, like, we have to understand this reality of union. You are made one with the Father when you trust in Jesus. And there's a sense in which that's not fully accomplished yet, but it is just as good as done. And it's a reality. No one can take that away. The one who acts, no one can reverse it. And when Jesus makes you his, no one can take that away. And because of the work of Jesus, all that's left for you is to simply believe. And if if you've not trusted him yet, like fully trusted Jesus, We want you to believe that he is the I am or you will die in your sins. And for those of us who have trusted in him, may we be reminded again of the good news and turn to the only one who can save. To turn again from false rescuers and false idols that we think can fulfill and save us and turn again to Yahweh, the I am, Jesus, the Messiah who came and died for your sins while you were still a sinner. We can smile when facing the fires of death and the torrents of destruction. We don't have to fear because in Christ, Yahweh is with us. We don't have to have reservation when God acts to destroy sin because we have been rescued from it and our sin has already been destroyed on the cross. Christ has exchanged his righteousness for our sin and given us his, the smile of the father. Now in Christ, you're the kids who never disappoint their parent. You guys know what it's like to have the the critical father over you or mother over you. We can even be that constantly critiquing because we don't want our kids to embarrass us. Like Hebrews tells us that God is not ashamed to be called yours. Like he's not ashamed that you bear the family name no matter how many times you've messed it up. Like he's not ashamed of you. What in the world? 
God knows your frame. He knows you're simply dust and he's provided a rescuer who is gentle and lowly in heart. And when we begin to grasp this and we turn to him instead of other things, it actually transforms us. Like people can actually change through the power of the spirit. Like transformation is possible. And it doesn't happen perfectly until Jesus comes back, but it does happen. Just like Jesus burst into earth, his likeness burst into our hearts in the here and now. Eternity, the new creation breaks forth and we begin living more like Christ, slowly formed into his image. So so what are the implications of this? We become a people who are not of this world, just like Christ was not of this world. Now we are in the world, we're in the muck and the mire and the mess and we get dirty just like Jesus did, but our identity is clearly and obviously markedly different. Our homeland is not of this age. We seek a country that's to come, one whose maker and builder is God, the one where Jesus sits on the throne, not any earthly ruler. And just like Jesus, and we didn't look at it much, but he said he was sent to speak only what the Father told him. And just like us, empowered by the power of the Spirit, we don't say too little and we don't say too much. We just speak truth and wholeness and beauty and life, pointing everyone to Jesus where hope can be found. Like, that's my hope for me, because I get convicted about this, is that my conversations and my news feed might be filled more with the truth and beauty of Jesus than politics or sports or any other false rescuers the world tries to offer us. And we can have those conversations, but ultimately Jesus is where we place our hope. And it doesn't mean we don't talk about the reality of death and brokenness, but we don't grieve as those without hope. Yes, we're living in a land of death, so we grieve, but death does not have the last word. There is a reality of death, there's a reason for death, and there is also a rescue from death, and that rescue is a person, and his name is Jesus. Repent and believe the good news of the gospel. Let's pray.